couple yeah. months there. That all right, we all here? All right, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Can you hear me on the, on the mic? No. no. Are they on? No. Oh, there we go. There we go. You hear me on the mic? Okay, great. All right. Welcome tonight. Give me one more second. I don't have a pen. I must have a pen. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, call the meeting to order. We've done the roll call. I think we can uh, go ahead and do the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Stu, you want to lead us in the pledge tonight? Sure. It's up there, folks. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good job, guys. Right. Yeah. Oh, that made me happy. <laughs> Please, Pam, if you'd read the mission statement. The Thompson School District will be a school district that empowers, challenges, and inspires students, faculty, staff, parents, school leaders, and community members to learn, achieve, and excel. Thank you. First up on the agenda tonight is the adoption of the agenda. I will entertain a motion in a second to adopt the agenda. So moved. Seconded. I have a motion from Pam and a second from Don to approve the agenda. Are there any changes to the agenda at all? Seeing none, Laura Lee, if you would call the roll on the adoption, please. Paul Banks. Aye. Stu Boyd. Aye. Pam Howard. Aye. Lori Vista Ward. Aye. Don Kirk. Aye. And Barbara Cruz. Aye. Thank you. And that is unanimously adopted. Next is approval of the minutes from the April 7th, 2021 meeting. I'll entertain a motion and a second to approve those minutes. So moved. I have a motion from Stu and a second from Barb to approve the minutes from April 7th. Are there any corrections or changes to the minutes? Seeing none, Laura Lee, if you would call the roll, please. Paul Banks. Aye. Stu Boyd. Aye. Pam Howard. Aye. Lori Vista Ward. Aye. Don Kirk. Aye. Barbara Cruz. Aye. Thank you, and those minutes are unanimously approved. All right, brings us to the, super, uh, to the public participation portion of tonight's meeting. And first up is item 5.1, which is the superintendent's report, Dr. Schaefer. Good evening, uh, Madam President, members of the Board of Education. Um, first, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the staff here at Berthet High School for accommodating us uh, this evening in, our, uh, in the auditorium. We have just uh, adjourned from a joint meeting between the Thompson School Board and the Town of Berthet uh, trustees, uh, the mayor, the city manager, um, also a representative from the, the CEO of the Berthet Library was here as well. So it was, uh, it, it's great. We always love coming down here to Berthet. We appreciate the uh, hospitality and more importantly, the collaboration between the school district and uh, the town. <clears throat> Several weeks ago, the Thompson Education Foundation hosted the Thompson Trailblazer Awards virtual ceremony. Each year, the event honors educators from across our district in four categories and then chooses one overall winner from among all of the nominees. I want to publicly recognize and acknowledge each of our award winners this year. So the uh, TSD staff member of the year uh, was Jordan Jennings, a counselor and athletic coach right here from Bertha High School. We had uh, co-principals of the year, uh, Dion Davis and Ian Stout. Uh, Dion is the principal of Coyote Ridge Elementary School up in Fort Collins, and Ian Stout is the executive director of Loveland Classical School, so congratulations. The Elementary Educator of the Year Award went to uh, Karen Shoemate, who's a second grade teacher at Mary Blair Elementary School. The Secondary Educator of the Year uh, went to Erica Grice, um, who is an exceptional services uh, student, ex I'll get it, exceptional student services teacher at Mountain View High School. And finally, uh, the Thompson Education Foundation Educator of the Year went to Barb Hartman, who is our uh, District Health Services Coordinator. Uh, she was recognized, I mean, really it was the year of the nurse, you know, the school nurse certainly, and, and, and given our pandemic, uh, Barb has been just absolutely Herculean in her accomplishments and achievements, so well-deserved. 
Late March and April is uh, the CMAS testing window here in Colorado. Uh, CMAS stands for the Colorado Measures of Academic Success. They're the state's common measurement of students' progress at the end of the school year in English language arts, math, science, and some years social studies, although not this year. Uh, this year, the State Board of Education approved a partial waiver from the federal government to reduce the amount of testing given the uh, effects of the pandemic and the need to preserve additional teaching and learning time. So students in grades three through eight um, take the CMAS test in either math and English language arts. And so students in eighth grade took, uh, also took the CMAS science assessments. Results will be used by staff and schools to monitor student growth and achievement, as well as provide feedback to classroom teachers around uh, the progress that students are making in their classes. Data is used from year to year to help inform instruction, as well as provide insight into the academic needs of students. <clears throat> Finally, last week I held three different student advisory sessions with elementary, middle, and high school students. These students were selected by principals from each school to provide voice and feedback to the leadership at the district. Topics range from feedback around mental health and student engagement to celebrations and opportunities around how the district navigated the pandemic this school year. Uh, it's absolutely important that we continue to leverage student voice and not just talk about and around students. We need to talk with them as well. And we will look to hold probably one more in-person session with our middle and high school advisory students before the end of the school year. So uh, certainly appreciate um, the kids and they were amazing. Okay, next we have our top of Thompson Awards. So um, each month we recognize um, a member from our classified, licensed, and APT staff. These are peer nominated awards. So what we'll do is I will call um, pairs up and if, when, when you hear a name, if you come forward and please speak at the podium here. We'll start with classified. And so um, Lexi uh, Dozier nominated Randy Williamson. So if Lexi and Randy can please make their way up. And this is uh, classified. Uh, Randy is a building secretary at Loveland High School. This is a tall podium. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name is Lexi Dozier. I am a teacher at Loveland High School and Randy is new to Loveland High this year and she has jumped in with 100% enthusiasm and compassion. Licensed, classified, and admin staff alike rely on her for information and direction all day long. If anyone has a question or needs to share information with the building, Randy is our go-to point of contact. Every time I see her, whether remotely or in person, she is smiling and praising others. Randy has a clear dedication to the students and families in the LHS community and has absolutely dedicated herself to providing a sense of calm and reassurance during these ever-changing times. Randy's positive attitude is infectious and she's always elevating the spaces she's in. I know that I have been craving stability when seemingly every single day feels like a shift from the norm and Randy has provided that for my work life and that of many others. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And we also have a, a little plaque for you. So. Thank, Dr. Schaefer, I just want to say thanks, Randy. It's nice to put a face to the memos that I get from Loveland High School. So keep up the good work. Appreciate it. <laughs> So we're going to move on to our uh, licensed uh, staff. And so we have Nancy LaBianca um, and Nancy nominated Terry Bellinghausen. Uh, Terry is a third grade teacher at High Plains. So if uh, Terry and Nancy can please make their way to the podium. Nancy's not here. Oh, then I get to read. Come on up. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's good. Maybe she went to the ad building. Yeah. yeah. No, she's the one who told me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Terry. Nice to see you. Good to see you. So Terry has been a teacher in the Thompson School District for 20 years. She has always taught third graders at Van Buren and now is at High Plains School. When she was at Van Buren, she started the 100 Mile Club and was the wellness facilitator and carried those traditions here to High Plains. She was also the Be Strong, Be Fit facilitator for nine years in the district. Terry has always believed the importance of having brain breaks and keeping students active in order to help them, uh, be, active, uh, in order to help them be active in their learning. 
I have watched her teach in the classroom and what struck me was her love for her students. She always puts their needs before her own, teaches with discipline and rigor, yet has kindness and empathy in her heart. Before we even had digital portfolios, Terry had her students sit on her side of the conference table, showing their parents their work, explaining to their parents what they were proud of and how they wanted to improve their grades. She is always exploring with new ideas in how to use the curriculum, testing out new strategies, and seeking ways to improve herself in the delivery of her lessons. She perseveres through difficulty and rejoices in the success of her students. She is the teacher that when you ask students who their favorite teacher is, they will not hesitate to say her name. She is full of integrity, determination, and she is always willing to work on any outside school activities when it involves the students. I am proud to call her my friend and coworker. I can't think of a better person to receive the title Top, Top of Thompson Award as she gets ready to retire this year after 20 years of teaching. Terry, congratulations. Congratulations. And Congrats, thank you. <laughs> Kevin, I get to read for Kevin Hyatt, who is our APT um, uh, nominee for Top of Thompson. And uh, Kevin was nominated by Jason Hetzel. Uh, Kevin serves as our custodial coordinator at the district office. Come on up, Kevin. Kevin works hard to provide all of us with the tools and resources we need to thrive and be excellent. His contributions often go unnoticed because for him, being in the field, working alongside crews, is more important than recognition or a pat on the back. Though he never misses an opportunity to encourage and recognize the hard work of others, he will reach out or stop by just to check in and say hi and to make sure you are doing well both professionally and personally. He understands that the emotional and mental aspects of life are just as important to morale and productivity as the tools and equipment. Kevin, congratulations. Thank you, sir. Congratulations. And now, I am pleased to introduce uh, the principal of Big T Elementary. So we're gonna ask Principal Sarah Walgast to come forward. As you know, each, at each meeting we um, showcase and highlight um, one of our awesome schools in our district. And so Big T, no exception, amazing school. And Sarah, take it away. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Schaefer. Good evening, Madam President and members of the board. As Dr. Schaefer said, I am Sarah Walgast and I am the proud principal of Big Thompson Elementary School. So we're here to share a little bit of what our focus has been this year. And I thought, what better way to have that than have some kiddos help me out with that. So I would like to invite down um, their teachers, Mrs. Franklin and Mrs. Strike, and then Jackson, Thomas, Taylor, and Shama, come on down. So while they're doing that, I'll just let you know, we have been really focusing on student-initiated, student-driven, and student-owned. And just some things that have happened within the school that have, have you know, just come up as, as ideas and we're like, yep, let's make that happen. We now have a bow tie and tie club. It's not a club, it's a we and every Wednesday. Anybody that wants to wear them, parent, you know, staff, kids, and that was initiated by a kiddo. Um, we also have a kindness lunch punch group that comes together with our counselor and just, you know, spreads kindness throughout the school. Um, and then we also have, it started off as my uh, counselor and media specialist doing it while we were out remote last year and now it's turned into more of a student driven thing where the students are doing the interviewing of people on campus and it's a video that is produced every um, week that we put out for our kids to watch. But within the classroom, we've been really focusing on the kids understanding and knowing their learning targets and their check for understandings and knowing like what is it that they're learning and where are they in that learning process when the teachers do that check for understanding. Um, and so along, go, along with that is that high quality work that we're looking for and of course that perseverance. The first grade team took this one step further and has gone into that part of the feedback, but not just from them, but student to student feedback, okay? And so these guys tonight are gonna share some of the work that they've done, and you can see the high quality work and the perseverance that went into this, okay? So I'm gonna be doing some interviewing with them right now. Um, so I'm gonna start with Taylor. Taylor, what did you create? So 
we created these of the space of our solar system. And we use some feedback. And here's my first one. So some of my friends said, like, put them in order. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, like a di um, a couple of days later, I um, did another. Wow. Cool. And I used some feedback to help us make new drawings. Okay, so she's, we practiced this a lot, obviously, so, so you knew what I was going to ask. I was going to say, Taylor, do you want to say anything else about how the feedback helped you? Um, feedback helped me to make more drawings and be a better creator. Awesome, thank you. Shama, what did you do to help other students to improve their work? Well, just like, well, just like Taylor said, I had to help the other people that weren't really making them in the order and in the lines and and how I helped is when the when my some of my friends that were not doing it in order got started over again. I they were kind of sad about it, so I cheat them up and told them that they have to start over again, not like in a bad way, just so like they can get it because I learned that you have to keep trying to make it better. How did you feel when you were working on this project? Well first I felt a little sad. A little sad because it turned out awkward. First it turned out like this was my second one. I need it I needed to put them in order very well because I didn't want it to be awkward. And I needed to label it so you guys won't just guess which one is which. So I tried my best on it and I was kinda happy when I finished it because it turned out great as I expected. And I did put it in auto. Thomas, you also revised your work to make it better. How did you feel, how did it feel to adjust your work? Good, it took a little time. I was sad when I figured out that I had to do a second draft. The only, like there's only a two or three reasons that I had to redo. Um, first, I did the sun a little too small for my first draft. And then I didn't have enough room to draw all of the planets in just one line. And I didn't have the orbit lines and when I tried to color in the sky, um, I writ solar system up here, but you can't really see it because I was coloring it. And then I redid my whole thing. So I did a second draft and I made it better. I drew a bigger sun and I drew the orbit lines. Then, and I did the planets in one line. I, I labeled them and I didn't color in the sky because I thought that would help a bit. Thomas, what did you learn from doing this again and making those adjustments? Um, that sometimes redoing is better. Persevere and try to do it again and it'll help a lot. Jackson, what did you need to adjust in your work to make it better? So, like, um, I made the uh, 
sun right up here and I made the planets down here. So I had to like cut it out and then I had to um, cut out the planets and then put it in order. And I took this like piece of paper to do the background, but I didn't take the orbit lines. And that's it. So what did you learn about perseverance? I learned to keep trying. <laughs> So I'm just going to let the, the two teachers explain how we got to this point in what they did with the kiddos. Um, hi, my name is Susanna Franklin. I'm, first, I'm their first grade teacher at Big T. Uh, we started this project with a suggestion from our um, instructional coach, Mrs. Witt, um, about a video called um, Austin's Butterfly about a little boy in first grade who um, tries to draw a realistic butterfly and um, with feedback from his peers, they were working in, in peer groups so that all of their second drafts is, um, they're made with peer back, um, feedback from other children. Um, but we, we followed that model. First we did the butterflies where they um, had four tries and then we took that and we did it with the solar system unit. Yeah, uh, yeah um, my name is Michelle Strike. And um, I just want to say that um, these kids did work really uh, hard, and we're really proud of the work that they did. Um, and it is important when we're teaching them to give feedback to each other that they um, that we create a safe place for them to accept that uh, feedback from each other. And so I think they're doing a great job. And I would agree. I'm really proud of all of you, and you guys have showed such poise. I'm really proud of you tonight as well. Good job. And I apologize and would be remiss if I did not in introduce our instructional coach. That is Leah Witt. She's the one that you know, does the work with our teachers and then of course the kiddos. And today when we did our final practice with the kiddos, I said to these guys, I said, do you realize that there are uh, many adults that have trouble accepting feedback and going back and redoing something? <laughs> and so, you know, they admitted that there were tears, but they understand now that to get that high quality work, they've got to work hard and to maybe do it again. Thank you. Great, great job, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Big T. It's really impressive to see what um, first graders can do. We'll, we'll see you guys in a couple of years, right? <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, Dr. Schaefer, you're OK. Next up is uh, item 5.4, which is board committee reports. And I'll just start down here with Paul and go down the line. No You're set? OK, Barb. Hold on. I've got to find my calendar here. <laughs> <laughs> it was a busy month. It was. Um, I think it started with the, I'm, going, I'm just thinking of April. I guess that's where, we're, yeah. Yeah. The, the uh, reception for the student teachers, which is one of the things that we did. Um, I have Family Pie, which is the policy council for um, early childhood. And then um, I sat in on the TIF uh, Teacher Thompson Education Foundation Awards. Um, I finally had to watch it separately because it was, I was struggling with it, with it getting going. And then um, I'm on the High Plains Design Committee. And so um, I met with them. Then otherwise, just sat, sat in on negotiations and some of those kinds of things. Pam. Whoops. <laughs> um, also attended the um, student teacher reception, which is always fascinating to hear their insights about um, our district and our schools. And then sat in on one day of negotiations. Um, and then also Thompson Education Foundation, obviously, has been very busy. Uh, I. Um, was you know sat in on the trailblazers which dr schaefer mentioned are are amazing winners um from the district and it was kind of sad not to be able to do it in person but really exciting to see them surprised when kim makely sharon <laughs> yeah, that was yeah that was hilarious i mean they were so surprised yeah. um so anyway that was fun so um barb hartman was the educator of the year and then um, the next upcoming event for Thompson Education Foundation <clears throat> will be the um, 
Loveland Classic, and this is this has been going on for I honestly I don't even know how many years, but it's a fundraiser um, that Thompson Education does every spring. It's going to be Saturday, May first, and um, there will be a 5K course. You can walk, run it. You can bring your dogs, your kids, your baby strollers. There's a 10K course, and then there's also a kids fun uh, one mile course. So it's a really great family event. It is out at Sentara, the lakes at Sentara goes around the trail, so it's beautiful. The views are great. If you want to sign up or get more information, um, you can um, go to thompsontef.org and click on events, and um, we'd love that support. Thanks so much. Thanks, Pam. Um, in addition to the uh, trailblazing Thompson and the student teacher reception, um, I also uh, participated in two webinars put on by CASB, the Colorado Association of School Boards, which had to do with identifying community members who are built to serve, um, learning how to encourage community members to step up and uh, run for school board positions because there'll be elections in, in uh, November. So um, that was interesting. And uh, the other thing I did in addition was last night there was a, a online meeting regarding the consolidation of Conrad Ball, Monroe, and um, Mary Blair Elementary School. So I attended that as well. Stu. All right. I'll just comment on a couple of things that that I did that I think the other board members weren't part of. Um, I attended the monthly meeting virtually of the Birth at Schools Fund, which is the group that puts on the Birth at Bash, and they are working hard to create a very different kind of an event, which is going to uh, be held on the 21st of August, and I'll fill you in on other details related to that. Then I'm the board liaison to the Master Planning Committee, always uh, an interesting and important committee to be part of. We heard a report on bond funded projects. Currently uh, bond funds are uh, being put to work at 32 buildings, 1,059 different line items, and something I think the board will be pleased to know, because I was certainly pleased to know it, the uh, bond projects are on schedule and on budget. And I also heard an update on facilities. The district has purchased a new maintenance software which uh, allows the staff to forecast needs. Those needs are then prioritized and um, are then assessed in terms of, of the needs. So it was a, um, a very informative and, and an important meeting to attend. Thanks, Stu. Don. Uh, so I went to some of the same events, so I'll do what Stu did. Um, I, we did have a really great special education advisory committee meeting this month. Uh, lots of conversations around uh, how do we support our students as well as, what is that? Uh, as well as uh, just trying to get the kids through the end of this year. Um, we had a, a really strong meeting with the equity task force and then included presentations from several um, members of staff explaining some of the work that's going on that <laughs> parallels into this. Um, I did get to go to a meeting with several members of the State Board of Education, mostly explaining um, how ESSER funds are going to be used as well as other components of the American relief fund i might be saying that wrong i'm sorry i didn't write that part down um we did some great data reviews and really did a deep dive into our middle school data which all of us did but no one brought it up yet um, i also had a chance to meet with um, congressman joe nagus's office uh, he couldn't make it that day but his office was very supportive of, of really wanting to understand what the education needs of northern colorado is and that was hosted by casby and then um, also was at my last Ferguson High School special or uh, school advisory committee meeting. <laughs> All right, thank you. And that takes care of uh, board, board and committee reports. And I believe there were no one who was signed up for public comments, correct? And we had none called in as well. Right. Okay, so we can pass over public comments for tonight. Brings us to. Um, the 
action consent items. Item six, I'll go ahead and read them. We'll, uh, I'll entertain a motion in a second for approving them as a whole. If there's anything that anyone wants to pull off there, let me know, we can pull it off separately. Item 6.1, approval of personnel extra duty coaching recommendations. 6.2, approval of gifts and donations. 6.3, second reading of exhibit JQE, the 2021-2022 course fees. Item 6.4, approval of change order and associated budget for Loveland High School best grant work. And item 6.5, approval of change order and associated budget for Thompson Career Center dust collection system. Is there anything on there that anyone would like to remove? Seeing nothing, I will entertain a motion and a second, please. So moved. I have a motion from Dawn and a second from Barb to approve the action consent items as presented. Is there any discussion at all? Should I read the gift? Oh, yes, thanks, Pam, awesome. <clears throat> there was one gift um, for this reporting period and that was $1,970 for education at Bertha High School right here. And that gift came from the Texas Instrument Foundation and the Thompson Education Foundation. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Texas Instruments. Yeah. All right. Uh, Laura Lee, if you'd call the roll, please. Paul Banks. Aye. Stu Boyd. Aye. Pam Howard. Aye. Lori Vista Ward. Aye. Don Kirk. Aye. Barbara Cruz. Aye. Thank you. And the action consent items are unanimously approved. Next up is item seven, which is discussion action item, amended resolution for director district C board vacancy. Um, let me pull this up real quick. So um, as you can see in your packet that uh, uh, Mark Setter had to tender his resignation effective March 4th. And we um, went ahead and uh, amended the closing date for applications. It's been extended from, initially it was from March 25th. We've extended that out to Friday, May 14th. And we'll review candidates, letters and applications and conduct the interviews at the meeting on Wednesday, May 19th, the regular school district meeting, and then, or school board meeting. And then the board member will be appointed most likely at that meeting, um, but definitely by May 24th. So are there any questions from the board on that? We, I will take a, a action or a motion, sorry, a motion in a second to approve that, just kind of technically. Are there any questions or, no? Uh, just editorializing here, I would encourage anyone who lives in Director District C, which is sort of Northeast Loveland, up around the Seven Lakes area, all the way up to the border of the district, which is uh, Trilby Road in Fort Collins. Um, so that area, um, anyone who's interested, you can pick up an application at the school district office as well as online. Okay, Quite motion and second, please. So moved. Got a motion from Stu and a second from uh, Don to approve the amended resolution. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, Laura Lee, if you would call the roll, please. Paul Banks. Stu Boyd. Aye. Pam Howard. Aye. Lori Vizdeward. Aye. Don Kirk. Aye. Barbara Cruz. Aye. Thank you, and that passes unanimously as well. All right, next we have some discussion items. Um, item 8.1 is the English Language Development Curriculum Adoption. And I have Shannon. <laughs> it's really, it, you know, I can't, it's hard to see. It's like you're on stage here, you know. <laughs> Shannon Clark will present on this one. Thank you, Shannon. Yeah, I didn't know if they needed paper copies. It's the same thing that they already have. Yeah. So there's paper copies if, if you all might need those. Um, Would but you I, mind taking your mask off? Oh, thank you. Thank you. you. <laughs> There are paper copies if um, <laughs> any of you would like that, but I, it's the same um, that you have electronically as well. And I'm going to need these tonight. <laughs> Madam President, Dr. Schaefer, members of the board, I'm Shannon Clark, Director of Curriculum and Learning Design. And tonight I will be recommending curricular materials for our secondary English language development courses. I'll wait until. Oh, 
Well, she's doing that, Shannon. Quick question. Uh, elementary is Elementary next. is still covered, and um, they actually are using the ReadyGen materials oh, okay. um, that were adopted yep. a couple okay. of years ago. So as we're looking at instruction and curricular resources, we obviously keep the uh, TSD portrait of a graduate at the core of our work. And uh, we also align the work with the focus areas of STRIVE 2025. This specific work around secondary ELD implementation really addresses all four of these areas in the strategic plan, um, really looking at student achievement, um, creating that inclusive and supportive culture, human talent through the professional development, and stewardship of resources, making sure that we're, we're getting the right materials in front of kids and teachers. So our process for this adoption followed the same framework that we've used before. We started by identifying core learning values with the ELD staff. We then looked at the available programs. We went through an evaluation of three programs and landed on moving one into the trial process based on the core values identified. We use the resources in a trial, getting feedback from staff and students, and opening up feedback avenues for parents and community. Based on the feedback from the trial, we're bringing our recommendation forward tonight. The timeline for this process did look a little bit different uh, than other adoptions, understandably so. We actually began the process in the fall of 2019, and we're ready to trial materials in spring of 2020, and then that didn't happen. So we, were, uh, we postponed until January of 2021. We had a comprehensive group of people to work on this resource trial and selection. Um, so you'll see all of the, the names of the teachers and staff that worked on this. Um, a very special thank you to Greg Simons, Doug May, Julie Sullivan, and Megan Edmiston, who really saw this process all the way through. So three programs were selected to bring forward to the rubric evaluation. Um, that was National Geographic, Pearson I Lit, and HMH Escalate English. I am not teaching ELD. Um, so that may be not how you say that. Um, these were selected based on core values and state and regional district use. On a four-point scale evaluating content of the three materials by ELD staff, National Geographic scored an overall 3.3 compared to HMH 2.0 and Pearson 2.5. On a four-point scale, or I'm sorry, the content rubric evaluated reading, foundational skills, speaking and listening, writing, scaffolding and differentiation, and cultural relevance and sustainability. On a four-point scale evaluating the core values of the three materials by ELD staff, National Geographic scored 3.3 compared to HMH 1.9 and Pearson 2.3. The core values rubric evaluated cultural responsiveness, engagement, and equipped or the transference of the learning. All six of the teachers involved in the trial gave positive scores to the overall learning of students using this resource. 100% of the teachers also gave a positive score on National Geographic's support with reading and cultural responsiveness. Teachers positively commented on the interconnectedness of the National Geographic materials to other content areas, as well as the rigor of the writing and speaking opportunities. 23 of the 27 students involved in the trial rated the resource a three or higher in all areas, which is pretty good considering they're secondary students. Um, and students stated that the lessons were interesting, that they learned more vocabulary to use in their speaking and writing, and that they gained confidence in their reading. So the next slide, you'll see some quotes from students, and these are their words, uh, hence quotes. Um, and these are regarding, obviously, the National Geographic materials. As you can see, they highlighted that they found the materials interesting, relevant, and connected to their other learning. 
So based on the positive perception data by both staff and students, as well as the comprehensive nature of the resources that really support uh, newcomers through English language proficiency level four students in the ELD program, we recommend adopting the following curricular materials. The National Geographic Newcomer Materials, the National Geographic Inside for middle school, and the National Geographic Edge for high school. The next slide shows you the cost breakdown for purchasing these materials. These costs cover six years of materials, so um, the only annual cost will be the shipping costs of um, new materials that, that we need to bring in, the um, consumables that the students might use, and then any enrollment increases. So this will be the, the big lift, um, and then from there it's um, just maintaining. So our professional learning plan um, is on the next slide, and, and this is the plan for the ongoing and sustainable training and professional learning for each year. Um, the initial implementation program training will be offered before school starts next fall. The teachers involved in the trial, which was actually all of our secondary ELD teachers, have already gone through an initial training on that um, before they trialed the materials. Trialed? Is that a word? Sure. Used the materials in a trial? Okay, um, and, um, but we will go through and do an actual training before school starts next year with everybody again. Um, the first year trainings will be a combination of National Geographic trainers and in-district collaboration. Years two through six will be continued instructional support based on the needs of the teachers. We know that training and collaboration must be built in and continual for the best implementation to occur. Any questions? Questions board, Barb. I just have a question. Is it all actual material in their hands or is a lot of it digital? It's a combination. Okay. So there are um, digital resources okay. as well as physical resources. That way it can um, be used kind of regardless of the setting and they can um, access things at home. It, they can also use the books. And so we wanted to make sure that there's a combination. Okay. Any other questions? Stu? Shannon, if the National Geographic Inside is intended for middle school and the National Geographic Edge for high school, who's the intended audience then for the newcomer materials? So the newcomers it is a specific group of students that um, are, are rated is Megan here yet? <laughs> no, okay. So um, it, it's students who have less than a year of English language development. Okay. And so um, they, they've only been in the United States for less than a year, and they score below the one proficiency on the WIDA score. And so there's an actual way to identify newcomer students that don't go into the uh, typical ELD materials because they need something very different at that level. So they wouldn't necessarily be using inside or edge, they would be using um, a simpler, an, an easier set of materials until their skills exactly. are enhanced and they yes. can move on. Okay. Yes, yeah, so it's scaffolded that way, yeah, too. Yeah. Uh, two questions, quick. How many students approximately in secondary? Uh, 27 to 30-ish right and now. That's the whole game, that's yes. the whole gamut? Yes. Okay. And then my other question was, um, you mentioned a couple of times cultural responsiveness. So assuming kids come from different cultures, how, how does that work? I was just kind of curious like what that means um, well, the cultural response, yeah, the, the cultural responsiveness is really looking at how do you build in um, activities and learning um, for whatever students are in front of you at that time. So it's really, you know, the, hence the name, you're responding to the students in front of you. And so this looks at um, not just, you know, students who may be Spanish speaking, but students from, from multiple cultures and these activities or this um, program allows you to be more responsive to whoever might be sitting in front of you and where they're coming from okay. is, is in a nutshell. Okay. Go ahead, Stu. 
Shannon? Where are um, these programs housed, both the elementary and the secondary? Uh, you, you want specific schools, yes. Stu? Yes, I'm curious as, oh, to, where, look at as that. to where they are. The, yes, Megan and Julie are here just in time. Um, <laughs> I believe we have uh, ELD in every sector. You know, we every secondary school. Okay. And then newcomers are right now in um, one middle school and one high school. And next year they will expand to two middle schools and two high schools. Three middle schools and two high schools. All right. And at the elementary level? At the elementary, I believe that all elementary have ELD programs okay. right now. Yes. I didn't realize it was that widespread. And newcomers at two. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Any other questions? So this will come back for approval next meeting. Awesome. You guys just showed up. Do you want to do <laughs> Hi. You want to say anything? <laughs> Thanks, Shannon. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Next up is item 8.2, the 2021 to 2022 school year school day start end times update. Madam President, members of the board, uh, Dr. Schaefer, Don Huckabee, Chief Academic Officer. So tonight I wanted to give you an update of where we are around um, school start and end times. As you'll recall, a um, member of you were on the board in the 2017-2018 school year when we did extensive study about changing school start times. And at that point, for the uh, starting in the 2018-19 school year, we made the change of having elementary students start earlier and secondary students start later. And so just to kind of give you some background, in 2017-18, the elementary school times were 8.30 to 3.30, the middle school was 7.25 to 3.30, and the high school was 7.30 to 2.58. We then made the change in 2018-19 for elementary to start at 8 o'clock and end at 3.10, for middle school to be 8.45 to 4 o'clock, and then high school from 8.30 to 3.50. That worked really well for 2018-19 and 2019-20. Then we had to plan for COVID. And so for this school year, we had to make a change for the middle school time because we needed to make sure that we had enough transition time to disinfect and clean buses between when students would be dropped off. So this year our times are, um, the elementary stayed the same at 8, 8 o'clock to 3.10, the high school stayed the same at 8.30 to 3.50. The one that we needed to change was the middle school, which was is now this year 9 o'clock to 4.15. So whenever we have kind of these big changes, um, we're talking to our middle school principals, we're talking, um, they're going to be surveying staff and families to get a sense of do we stay, you know, what's their feeling about nine o'clock, you know, staying with this new nine o'clock to 415 time, or do we go back to the 845 to four o'clock? So no decision's been made. Um, we're in that investigating process of getting that feedback from those who are most directly impacted. Um, you know, this year we did it just because we had to, uh, to make it um, safe for kids. And now, now we have the opportunity to really weigh, we did one way for two years, we've done this, this new time for this year, and you know, we'll bring forward a recommendation to you um, in probably your second May meeting, just to make sure we have enough time to get uh, feedback from schools. Any questions? Yeah, questions, anybody? So it'll either go back to the way it was or it'll stay this yeah. way. You Correct. know, I'm glad, I'm glad we had this because all year, yeah, all school year, I've been wondering why the Bill Reed kids are all late. <laughs> because I'm thinking, these kids need to be in school and they're walking by my house. And I don't, I, I refrain myself from going out there and saying, you know, move it. But <laughs> glad to know they're not all late. Okay, oh, I love awesome. It. Um, so I was just wondering, I mean, clearly we did it because we had to this year. Are there benefits to keeping it? So yes, um, for us, our, for what we know already. For what we know, I mean, this. I mean, it, you know, we know the the background of research around the students and, and older students having that little bit later um, later start time. So even that extra fifteen minutes is beneficial for kids, um, for them extra sleep. Um, you know, and, and the fifteen minutes later on the end of the day is not. Um, it's not having as as big of an impact on at, you know activities after school as we initially thought might might have been a concern. So um, it, it's definitely, there's benefits to that, um, to having kids have that little bit of extra 
extra time to sleep in the other, you know, from just a logistics thing to start everything at either 8, 8.30 or 9 seems pretty kind of clean pretty clear cut yeah and clean yeah i i mean I, I i back up the the science of this i mean it's it's irrefutable and so anything we can do to get those kids even 15 extra minutes to sleep and get ready and whatever else it takes so that there's less craziness in the mornings is great so that's fantastic and i'm glad that it worked I, even though we didn't plan it this way, yeah. I'm, I'm actually hopeful that the feedback keeps it that way. Thank you. You want to talk? Oh, yeah. yeah. Eventually. Okay. I just couldn't hear you, Dawn. If you can oh. talk into your microphone. <laughs> okay. That's when I got closer last time, I it was like was too loud. Yeah. I know. Um, I know. Sorry. I was just backing up the science of it okay. and yeah. how great it is that um, it's working out. So I kind of hope that the feedback is to keep it. Did you see the recent study that came out? I think it was five days ago about um, they, they um, CNN actually and the Journal of Sleep. So researchers uh, surveyed 28,000 students in the Cherry Creek School District um, to find out what the past two years have been like for them since they went to Late Start. They were really the first district and then we followed immediately after them. And they have found that moving school start times later in the morning resulted in increased sleep times of around 45 minutes. <laughs> Um, for each of the students. I mean, it's pretty, pretty major. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were worried, like, oh, they'll just, you know, stay up later, all those things that people were concerned mm -hmm. about. No, they're actually getting a lot more sleep. I mean, 45 minutes is a huge chunk of time yeah. every night. Like, that's not just, <laughs> so. Oh, anyway, yay. yeah, check that out. CNN, Journal of Sleep. They just did that uh, Cherry Creek study, so. Awesome. Great. Thanks, John. Next is item 8.3, Declaration of Surplus Property Water. Todd Picconi. Yes, good evening, Madam President, Board of Education, Dr. Schaefer. Um, tonight for discussion is Declaration of Surplus Property. So by board policy uh, DN, uh, school property disposition, the board has the authority to sell or lease any district property that may not be needed in the foreseeable future upon such terms as it may approve. Uh, so tonight for discussion is a share of water right that we own, currently own, uh, 7008. That is a home supply share that was um, going to be dedicated to the Riverview PK8 property. Um, as we, fi as we fin finalize design, move through the process um, and work through the town, we found we do not need that uh, share. So the um, asked tonight is to dedicate that as surplus property. We'll come back for a second reading. Uh, so then we can place a black back on the market um, for a selling price of approximately $400,000 um, to then move forward on the open market with that share. So for discussion or questions tonight, is anything um, pertaining to that policy or label that surplus? Uh, how much did you pay for it? You know. Yes, we paid 400000 We paid 400000 yeah. for it. So we can't make a profit. There's always that chance. There's, there's, a, there's a chance. Does this yes. kind of stuff go? Oh, seriously though, does this kind of stuff? I mean, yes. water's limited, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's only so much water. So yes. Yeah, so it, our minimum price is that. Our goal is to try to um, see where the market uh, evaluation is at to possibly push it more. Yes. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. Just saying. That is true. <laughs> okay. So you'll come back uh, next time. For approval on this, right? Yes. Review vote. Any qu any further questions? I didn't look down this way. No. All right. Thanks, Todd. Uh, item. You might as well just stay there. Item eight point five is Conrad Ball Middle School consolidation. Oh, sorry. Did I miss something? Uh, COVID. He's there for there for that too. Oh. But I'll stay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. He's this eight point four COVID update. Yes. So thank you again, and tonight for discussion is a brief presentation on an update on our COVID response since we've been back to full person and learning since March 22nd. So for tonight, we'll look at, uh, again, just the current practices that we are practicing within the schools, um, the testing, semester data as far as quarantines and positives, a vaccine update, and then um, in-person tracing evaluation, so that's contact tracing evaluation, and basically looking at what the teams are doing um, as cases are coming up. The current practices for healthy schools, so not much of this has changed, but um, 
I will say still the vaccines, we are still pushing, um, obviously staff had their opportunity. We now have opportunity for uh, 16 and 17 year olds that we are pushing out um, through Mike Hausman's department. We also have an opportunity coming uh, this weekend in the Bertha area. Um, CDPHG, the Colorado Department of Education, actually, I'm sorry, of Health and Environment, <laughs> is going to use their community bus to um, come to Bertha so we can not only uh, help the Bertha community but also uh, the students in this area. A little bit on semester data. So as you can see, this uh, chart goes from uh, 322, about to start the in-person learning, to 419 uh, is the most, is the current data for uploaded. As you can see, we started uh, with pretty low quarantines and then there is a general um, uptick and spike to, you know, the maximum being around for uh, April 8th, April 8th. And you can see also our um, decrease of quarantines just within the last three or four days. Um, we'll note positivity on the next slide, but um, this is actually aligning with the current trends of the county as well. So the county actually was following about the same trends as we saw here. Um, in the last seven days, the county, county's numbers uh, on the seven day positivity have gone down and it's reflective of the same um, chart you'll see here. The next is the semester data. So the positivity by school, so here we wanted to show, um, similar to how the ca uh, county um, um, shows their positivity in the last 14 days, that's the numbers you'll see here. So this is the secondary schools and the positive tests we've had in those schools um, in the last 14 days. You'll note that there are a couple of schools that um, you know, we do review with the county when you look at a couple of the numbers that are a little higher, um, in particular, you know, Bertha High and Thomas Valley High School. Um, we were with Tom Gonzalez today in this auditorium uh, talking to the entire staff of Berthoud just to review you know, where the numbers are at um, and really reassure that the numbers we're seeing are not coming from you know, school spread. As the numbers reflect on the previous slide, the decline in the community is also showing decline in our schools, which really reinforces the fact that um, when we see cases. They're coming from outside of the community uh, into our schools, but it's not actually happening in the school environment. Just a little update on um, our own testing site. So you can see we've um, done 207 tests. We've had uh, about a po positivity of those tests of about 5.3%. Um, we did go down to one day a week because the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, there just wasn't any much coming. What we have seen that's positive since we've gone to one day is people have utilized it almost more. So it almost gave them a focus of a day to go. And then we've also changed it to the afternoon, which I think has made it more convenient for students, staff, and parents to, to use. So vaccine, one of our um, latest pushes with the county is to provide vaccines for students um, 16 and older. That's the Pfizer. Um, vaccine. So we have sent communication out. As I said, there's a uh, vaccine bus coming here. The other piece that I've um, been talking to the county today that they're excited about is they're hoping by mid-May um, the FDA gives approval to actually lower that down to 12 and then uh, earlier. So that's exciting for our uh, community. The other thing that I want to share is in working with um, the county we um, identified a vaccine site um, that we wanted, to, we wanted to provide for our underserved communities. So uh, it was exciting last Saturday. We set up a whole vaccination site at Con Ball. The county came in. There were, were hundreds of doses um, given, and we're actually going to do that every other weekend um, at Con Ball to help all those families and have a space, uh, place for them to go to get the vaccine. On um, case investigation and the last part here I'll talk about is community help. Um, so in reviewing data with the county, so we've actually met uh, with the county more often as of late because we've had some more cases. Um, but what we're doing with them is talking to the contact tracers. Actually Tom Gonzalez, the director of public health, has been um, involved in those conversations uh, specific to a few schools. And we're looking at um, making sure the spread is not from, you know, within the school. Um, you know, what else can we do? Is there anything else we can we do? And then looking at where it's coming from. As you'll see here, um, 
99% of the spread is clearly coming from outside of the school and they're bringing it into the, the school itself. So we're not seeing um, transmission within um, the school. So for example, they will, um, through contact tracing, look where the positive individual is and then see if anyone in quarantine in the next 14 days has tested positive in that six foot circle. And we're not seeing that, which is um, you know helpful and exciting that the schools actually um, I think as Tom put it today, the safer place to be rather than, um, you know, outside of school. Um, the last point here that you know, we talked about this morning is it's, you know, part of this is a lot of this is what we can control in here, but, you know, we're not, our plan is not to roll back in person, you know, is to maintain that, but to ensure that we need the community help. So part of the messaging we set out to communities with uh, partnership with the county Monday was just saying that. We don't plan on going backwards, um, but we also need to maintain your help um, because we only have a few weeks left of school, so let's push to get to the end. And, you know, the plea to the community to ask to do what's right between, you know, the, the gatherings, the face masks, um, your distancing, and then um, also in sports, you know, doing what's right in those activities. And that is all I have. Is there any questions? Questions for? What was our staff? vaccination rate or what is it so far we don't know the exact because um, but we do know it's over 90 closer probably to the 93 ish wow, 95 -ish percent awesome. yeah that's fantastic well done <laughs> yes only because I think I misread it <laughs> based off of how you said it but on that last slide it says outside activities are a large percent of the slide you're talking about outside of school, not necessarily outdoors, outdoors. correct? Correct, outside of school. Okay. Yes. <laughs> you started talking, I was like, that's not what I thought. Yeah, right. Sorry. yeah. So, okay. yes. Thank you. Absolutely. And Todd, I have a question about the, um, the Conrad Ball lo uh, vaccination location. How are we getting the word out to, to people? <laughs> to the, the community yeah, around? Yeah. Um, so the county did a big push in that area when they started. So in the websites, they pushed out actually an, an email. Um, last Saturday was their initial setup and start a trial to see how they set up because it was a new site. Um, now we're going to work with them to set out um, through our families uh, more of a mass communication. So it's it's wider that communication is wider spread. Okay, yeah. and is that in in Con Ball in the building or is it in the? No, it's in the building. Okay. Yeah, similar to just a, a physician or a, a hospital. There's waiting rooms and stuff. Okay, because like our health, the health clinic, the Sunrise Health Clinic is over there, but that's. They are helping, and they are partnering with. Okay. They partner with the county to help provide some of the nurses and some of the staff. We're helping with the building and really the the structure space. of it, the space. Great. Yeah. So it's really the three entities coming together. And, so and does it have to be? Um, do the people that get the vaccines there have to be school people or can it be somebody from the neighborhood that no it can be someone okay. from the neighborhood so that's the goal is to, yeah okay. just get in yeah Great. anyone within the community or really anyone can go there yes Great. thanks any other questions Stu? i have the same question about the mobile bus about the bus coming to berthed in terms of how you're communicating that to the berthed community um so we have not but there's a reason <laughs> Um, the county is just um, finalizing the kind of plans with the state as, even as of today. So as soon as it's finalized and we have you know the dates and the, the time, um, okay. that'll go out. As we met earlier, Chris Kirk was also in that meeting to talk about how that's going to work. So it's going to be a pretty quick turnaround um, because their goal is they're pushing to get the Pfizer vaccine here so we can then also get some of the students. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we hear, then we can um, also help push something out. Okay. And in, in both cases, is it Pfizer? It is, yes. So we can get the kids, some yes. of the kids. Okay, great. Any other questions, board? All right. Now, Todd, uh, item 8.5, Conrad Ball <laughs> Middle School Consolidation. Right? Yeah, okay. uh, yes. <laughs> What's that? No, I'll just keep going that way. <laughs> <laughs> Muscle through. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'll need my own. Yeah, I would need language um, help with that one. <laughs> so tonight is a update on the uh, Comball consolidation. Um, so we'll look at just a brief consolidation overview. Uh, progress since the last board of education meeting that we provided an update. 
common themes from community meetings, uh, timelines, design process, and uh, ideas. So just a quick review is the why behind the proposed consolidation. So one is the consistent and historical decrease in resident students in the uh, Monroe, Mary Blair, and Conball areas. Uh, the cost and efficiency of operating um, three small schools, when I say small, under 50% utilized. And the biggest opportunity we have in front of us is we do have bond funds available that we can only spend on uh, capital construction that could be put towards this um, project. Um, just a note on that, um, that doesn't mean we're sacrificing any of the original bond scope. All that is maintained and still in the works as promised in the bond language. Um, another piece that uh, we looked at is just the rating and uh, condition of Conball. Uh, needs a lot of system upgrades and building upgrades. So a summary of community feedback opportunities. So there has been quite a bit of opportunity here in the last several months to um, share concerns, ideas. Um, the first three we had were with the individual communities at Mary Blair, Monroe, and Conball. We then combined the three communities, had a community meeting number four, and then last night we had community meeting number five, which was also the three um, communities combined. We've had um, Google Forms to the entire district so they could submit questions. Each individual school has also had um, Google Forms that the community could look at, and we've, as we've um, gotten new um, questions or ideas, we've then reflected those back in the general comments, as most of them seem to be aligning. Um, the other um, piece we did is before actually community meeting number one, we met with all the three staffs um, individually. Work with the master plan committee, and then also as of late, we had a CBOC meeting last week, and they requested a special meeting just to review the finances of um, you know, the proposed funding, just to make sure they are comfortable with to a recommendation um, to the board because they're the board appointed um, committee. So some common themes from the meetings. Um, one common theme was, did staff look at other options? So we reviewed, what about different boundaries? What if we did this school to this school? Um, what if we did Mary Blair as a K-3 and then Conball as a 4-8? So we did revo review those options um, and then looked at those with the community. Um, a couple other topics that came up quite a bit were was how would construction look? So there was a lot of concern about it's a uh, major remodel, major project. How do you do that with uh, students in the building and maintaining the um, educational side that the school needs to function? So we talked a little bit about what that looks like. Um, the one thing we uh, even reviewed last night was the contractors we interviewed. They um, are really professionals of school buildings. You know, there's few that specialize in this industry of uh, work, but um, the ones we're looking at are really specific to these types of buildings and renovations. One, to make sure the projects are safe and then the environment can be maintained. Um, another comment was, how will middle school students and elementary students be integrated? So that's not something that um, any district staff is going to recommend. That's really the community look at through the design process of whether they want those students integrated or not. And then programming. So Don uh, Huckby spent time talking about what does program look like in a K-8 different than what they have now. And then um, best grant. So there was a lot of conversations and questions on forums about, well, can we maybe just get the best grant if we are successful and use it elsewhere? So it was just reiterating that we, uh, if we are successful with the best grant, that we have to use those dollars um, as we specified. A quick review of the timeline. So the long-term timeline is we are in a planning stage now um, which includes the committee input, design. We would go to construction and then ultimate consolidation would be 23-24. Some of the short-term time, uh, short timelines as are referred to as the community meetings. Um, two pieces at the end that um, point out is May and June, we're still looking for uh, recommendation and approval for the proposed project and, um, and then the design process would start shortly after that. So we've not engaged or just started any of that until you know, we go through this process. A couple options since the last time and update is, what we want to show is the two options with the best grant and without. So this first option here is the best, what the um, project would look like with um, the best funding. I won't review the entire scope, but a couple of the main components are, you'll see the red outline. 
That is the extent of the air conditioning in the building that would be added. Um, the pieces of the building, it would still have enough for the programming, when I say pieces, the admin, the kindergarten edition, and auxiliary gym. When you look at um, what the project would look like without best funding, um, it's still a major impact to the building, as you can see in the rendering. But, for example, the HVAC gets taken down to the educational or the class general, general ed classrooms, um, rather than the entire building. There's no auxiliary gym, so some of the larger scope pieces um, would have to be reduced. To talk about the design process, should this project move forward, what does the design process look like? This is something um, throughout all community meetings is uh, the, the voice of community was very important. So this is the process we use to make sure we um, capture all that. So there's a design advisor group that is um, uh, consists of students, faculty, admin, community members, you know, other stakeholders that uh, want to be a part of it, parents, and ultimately they create uh, what's called guiding principles, and that's really what the design is based from. So those guiding principles of the community really guide the design. It's not guided by, you know, this is what it has to be or has to look like. We have certain pieces of the building that have to be a certain way, but as far as the um, pieces of the building that is part of the design, that's what the design advisor group looks into. So next steps. Tomorrow night we will spend uh, together talking about this as well. So uh, there'll be an in-depth review tomorrow in the study session to review um, this proposed consolidation. We did get a best from CDE that uh, on May 19th we are going to present to the, the uh, best board and CDE um, for this project. So we will kind of know if we're shortlisted shortly after that. Uh, May, June, we'll review the final scope and budget depending on the outcome of that um, grant. And then ultimately, you know, we will come to the board for recommendation in that probably late May first meeting. Late May would be the um, first discussion of it. Early June would be more or less the um, um, action on it. From there, is there any questions? Board. No? I just have one quick one. Um, you won't come back to us for uh, approval on this until after we know about the best grant. Is that true? Or are we not approving? Yeah, that is the plan now. So we'll know May 19th. They should short lease within a couple okay. of days and then um, we'll come. So if there's a delay with best, then there's a delay with us. It'll too. shift this process a little bit, okay. yes. Sounds good. Anybody else? All right. Thanks, Todd. And we'll hear more yep. tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Item 8.6, the 2021-2022 budget update. Gordon. First, uh, thank you to the gentleman from operations and facilities for yielding his time at the podium. <laughs> <laughs> Madam President, Dr. Schaefer, members of the board, I'm Gordon Jones, Chief Financial Officer for the district. Um, thank you for the opportunity to give you a quick update on progress to the 21 on the 2021, I'm sorry, on the 21-22 budget process. Um, first, alignment with uh, Strive 25, 2025 strategic plan um, obviously is uh, heavily involved in focus area four, stewardship of resources. Um, first, just a quick legislative update. I know um, everybody's following very closely the legislative process, I'm sure, and you know exactly where these bills are at. Um, the state budget uh, long bill, as it's referred to, is Senate Bill 21-205. That was introduced in the Senate. Um, it passed through the Senate with um, fairly minimal amendments in my mind. Um, moved on to the House, moved through the House with fairly minimal amendments as well, some different than the Senate, some in addition to, some in concurrence with. So now um, both of those chambers, um, the, the bill now moves to conference committee where the Joint Budget Committee um, will work with both chambers, um, the House and the Senate, to try to reconcile those amendments that have been proposed in both of the um, different chambers and come back with a bill that both chambers can then adopt. Um, I would think that that work um, hopefully could be done this week. 
um, and then it would need to be adopted or approved or ratified by both chambers and then at that point it would go to the governor for signature and uh, become law. Um, in association with that there's what's called a companion bill which is really from a school finance perspective much more important to us. That's the School Finance Act um, budgeting or uh, um, funding portion. That's a separate bill completely from the long bill, but it takes a lot of the information from that bill and details specifically what PPR numbers, per pupil revenue numbers um, would be, um, as well as other things um, within the, within the uh, budget process. So that's one piece that we're still waiting on right now. That bill has not been introduced yet. Um, couple of key points of this, the budget long bill, again, Senate Bill 21-205, it does assume a 2% inflationary factor, um, pretty typical um, for what we're seeing right now in the economy. It also has a placeholder for the legislation or legislature to approve of buying down the negative factor by 480 million, which would return it to still a significant number of 572 million, but that's a number consistent with what it was in 1920 um, before the um, significant increase last year with the um, expected budget shortfalls at the state level that pushed it to $1.17 billion. At the bottom of the, the second page there, you'll see um, just a brief historical um, reference over the last five years of what the PPR numbers have been. And um, it, it is significant to note that the $8,421 that's currently in the long bill um, that would be the Thompson School District portion um, of uh, PPR per pupil revenue is a significant increase over where we're at now, $703 increase. However, you have to note that that comes on the heels of a $346 decrease last year. So really it's getting us back to where we were two years ago plus a little bit more, plus a normal year's progress there, but progress nonetheless. The next couple slides deal with um, headcount numbers, student headcount numbers. So um, a, a big part of the budget is based on two things. How many students do we have and how much money do we get for each one of those students? So this shows um, headcount across the district. Um, it's important to note that this does include um, pre-K as well as the charter schools. Those, um, both of those are counted in our headcount numbers, but the charter um, dollars and really um, pre-K as well are direct pass-throughs. The district gets that money in and it, it's transferred directly to either the charters or to the pre-K program that we have within the district. Therefore, it's uh, more um, important to look on this slide at the TSD K through 12. Um, the dotted line that you'll see um, towards the right is just a separation between historical, where we've been and what we've planned for, or what we recorded on October counts, versus where we're actually at in the second to right column right now, versus what our estimate is for 21-22 in the far right. So you can see um, all, all entities there, with the exception of early childhood, um, show an increase for next year from where we are right now and from where our October count numbers were last October. So um, the, the bar across the top or the uh, graphic across the top, going from 16,278 students in the 17-18 fiscal year to 15,590 students projected for 21-22. That's a 688 student um, decline, a 1.1% per, annual decline if you annualize it over those five years. Does that number include the charter schools as well? It does. That's all? Okay. That is district-wide including charters, okay. yes. Moving on to the next slide, you'll see student headcount for TSD only. So this is broken down by level. So the, the green portion at the bottom of each one of those bars is the pre-K. Blue would be elementary, yellow middle school, and red high schools. So there, looking at that same graphic across the top, you can see a 14,934 count in 1718 projected to move to 13,718 for 21-22. 
that's a 1,216 student decline or a 2% annual decline. So comparing that to the previous slide, there would be an indication that while the overall percentage decline in the district is less, obviously at 1.1% than the 2% that we're seeing in TSD only, that would be some indication of the growth that we have seen in the charter schools in the district, um, primarily New Vision with the addition of their new school. Um, over the last, over that five year period, the, that, uh, that the uh, New Vision charter school has essentially doubled in their student count. Some of those students certainly coming from um, existing TSD schools. Um, one other point I'll mention on this slide is uh, the blue bars um, that you'll see here are the elementary. That's where we're seeing the largest increase projected for next year. Um, very uh, rationally because that's where we saw the largest decrease going from 1920 to 2021 um, was in the elementary population. Um, there is still um, some level of risk in this. This is the best information that we have available at the time, working with uh, Skip Armatoski, the district uh, demographer. Um, there's rationale. I've been through the models several times with him. There's rationale to expect. We saw a 1,000 student decrease TSD from eight, uh, 1920 to 2021. This anticipates recapturing 500 of those students. So still not getting up to where we were pre-pandemic, but recapturing half of those students. There are, uh, this year, um, more so than a typical year, more variables that are in play. Opening of Riverview Pre-K-8, coming out of a pandemic, recapturing of students that uh, perhaps families elected to homeschool that would elect then to come back into the district. Um, drawing students from out of the district into um, Thompson School District. Uh, students that were in an online program that was not within the district, it was some other online program outside of the district that then would elect to come back. Um, a, an awful lot of variables out there that, um, that impact that, not to mention the declining birth rate that we've seen across the, the nation over the last 10 to 15 years and um, just uh, the, the key point I want to make is a lot of unknowns about what that could be. There is rationale for having that 500 student increase. It could be 700, it could be 300 is what I'm uh, trying to get across. This is perhaps the uh, most confusing slide in the deck. A lot of numbers on here. This is just a sampling. Um, this is about uh, one eighth or one tenth of the entire school finance funding formula, some of the calculations that are involved. So I've just got done telling you that we have a 500 student planned headcount increase for next year. This slide refers to funded pupil count, which is what we actually get paid for from the state um, level. And this is projecting a decrease in funded pupil count. And you say, how can that be that we have 500 more students and we're going to get funded for even fewer students? And it's a, a lot of intricacies within the, the School Finance Act funding formula that's in the state constitution. But uh, a couple of the biggest things um, is there's an averaging factor that's called for. You can take the higher of your current year enrollment or the average of up to the five previous years, the current year plus four previous. So as you know, with averaging, as you can see with the, the two numbers that are circled, we're, we're losing or dropping off that fifth year last year, which was 15,372.5 funded pupils and replacing that with a 15,024. So um, just by nature of the math associated with that, we're losing a higher number and replacing it with a lower number so the average goes down. Um, it, it, it's a, um, I can't say enough, the complexity of the School Finance Act funding formula that determines the PPR number, or not the PPR, but the uh, funded pupil count number that we have that's being reflected here. So um, in the red numbers, you can see the benefit that the district got from averaging last year was 721 funded pupils. This year, that number is 90 funded pupils. That's what's creating this, uh, this disparity. 
These are not fun, uh, final numbers either. This will be determined by the state as they, um, once they finalize um, everything, um, that they'll do the actual calculations. This is just the, the interpretation based on what we're expecting for funded pupil count and student counts for next year that uh, I have arrived at for the, the budget for 21-22. Some of the considerations that we have, always with the target of, at a minimum, having a, bu a balanced budget um, going into the next year with the hopes that we would be able to add to reserves. From a revenue perspective, um, as I reviewed this um, today and noticed that the most glaring one that's not on there that is a significant item is even though we will have fewer funded pupils, we get significantly more money for those pupils from a PPR standpoint. So that $700 increase will be an increase in revenue that we see. Again, I, I caution the, the board, I caution the public to understand that those are based on estimates of what we think our funded pupil count is going to be. So those are subject to change certainly, but that's the largest revenue increase item that we would see. The other one, the first bullet point that you see that I'll uh, talk about is the MLO, the 2018 MLO specifically. Um, you'll recall in past presentations, I've informed you that the 1999 and the 2006 MLOs are capped out um, from a revenue perspective. They won't go any higher. They could go lower, but they would not go any higher, and it's highly unlikely that they would go lower. So those are pretty well locked in at the $14,040,000 that the district collects from those two MLOs. The 2018 MLO is a fixed mill um, at 7.6 mills. So as assessed valuation goes up, the revenue collected goes up. Conversely, as we saw in 2021, we had a 3.8% decrease in net assessed valuation across the district. So we had a decrease in revenue, about 700,000 less in revenue that was collected in, or is anticipated to be collected because we're still in the tax collection time period right now, really from February through June. So we had a decrease there. I will say that that decrease was primarily related to a significant decrease in the oil and gas um, valuation. There's a small sliver of the district's assessed valuation that is in Weld County that was, is highly um, influenced by oil and gas, and that had about a $90 million decrease in the value um, valuation. So that, that was the leading cause of the 3.8% decrease in an overall assessed valuation. Residential property actually went up last year within the district boundaries. And if you follow the news at all, or if you're in the housing um, real estate industry or looking to buy or sell a house, you know how uh, tight supply is right now and how um, housing prices have really within this area have really maintained where, they're, um, where they've been in the past. Next year for 21-22 is an assessment year, meaning all property is reassessed. In non-assessment years, it's only new construction and oil and gas is assessed every year, but primarily new construction that's um, revalued. In an assessment year like next year will be, all property is revalued. I would expect to see an increase. Um, a very conservative number um, that we've seen historically, and I mean very conservative, especially over the last six or eight years, um, would be 2%. That's what I'm uh, building into the budget right now is a 2% increase. Um, as a frame of reference, granted, no pandemic involved, but um, in the past we've seen double digit increases over the last three assessment years, um, over a six year period, we've seen increases of 28%, 16%, 14%. Um, in those years, so 2%, I would consider conservative, but I would, uh, um, if you have learned nothing else about me, you will know that I am conservative. So, um, just a, a frame of reference, for every 1% increase in the uh, assessed valuation or the AV, it's about 175,000 more in revenue for the district. Expenditures that we have to, that really the big expenditures that we have to consider um, looking at next year's budget. Um, this year, in 2021, the board um, 
issued or, or authorized two furlough days out of the general fund, which helped, uh, helped us um, from a budget perspective in the general fund. Those were replaced by four days that were funded out of federal stimulus dollars, but those came out of grant funding. So to start at a break-even point, we have to add back those two furlough days. So that's the starting point that's being built into the budget. The board previously approved an increase in health, dental, and life premiums for next year, which is about 700,000. The two furlough days is about 550,000 a day, so that's 1.1 million in total of additional expense that will go into the general fund in 21-22. The, because of the significant loss of students this year, 1,000 students down, um, about 350 to 400 from a funded pupil count down, um, that results in about a $3 million anticipated use of reserves out of, the, out of the reserve balance in 2021. We won't know that finally until we get to the end of the year and we've done all accruals and all those um, accounting magic things that take place. But um, that's a, a hopefully a conservative estimate too. Hopefully it will be less than that that has to come out of reserves. But that's the starting point to replace that use of reserve balance to get, again get back to a balanced budget. Um, potentially granting steps and columns, uh, that's the um, anticipation that is being planned in the budget, I guess, at this point, at least knowing what that cost would be. So that would be, um, uh, it's about a 2.45% increase, um, honoring steps and columns that then would be applied to the classified and APT staff as well. That results in about a two and a half million dollar increase in cost. And then inflationary increases in non-FTE costs, which are all those other things besides salaries and benefits. Heating, um, utilities for schools, uh, transportation costs, non-health insurance costs, liability insurance, building insurance, those types of things. Um, Estimated at 800,000, we're still working through some of those calculations right now, but that's another added cost that would be built into the budget next year for 21-22. Looking at the timeline that we're working towards, um, this would keep us in compliance with the statutory guidelines, which say that the board has to adopt, the board does not have to adopt, pardon me, it's recommended that the board adopt a budget for the next year. If they don't, then the budget that is automatically adopted is at 10% less expenditures than the current year's budget. Um, we would rather not visit that scenario. So by June 30th, um, we ask that the board adopt the budget. So this shows a timeline over the next four meetings um, where you will likely hear from me um, on budget updates um, over those next four meetings and kind of what you can expect. We're talking about general fund primarily here, but we have all the other funds um, that we have to address as well. And grant funds is going to be a, a particular challenge this year in setting the budget for next year with all of the federal stimulus dollars. We also have the building fund, we have the bond redemption fund, we have nutrition services fund. There's um, a, a variety, uh, eight or nine different funds that we have to budget as well. But uh, this gives you an idea of what the timeline is over the remaining four meetings before June 30th. Questions I could answer regarding the 21-22 budget process. Questions, John? I have a couple. So, I don't have page numbers. Can you, John, can you pull your mic yes. a little bit? Yes. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, on the TSD only, um, my question, it, I mean, you did your best to explain to us all the things that are fluid. What are some of the things that will help us solidify these numbers? Like, I know that there's got to be some timelines that will have a better count for this and that and the other thing. Can you run me through some of those? Ultimate um, most positive solid number is October count. So okay. obviously that's into the next year after the budget has been adopted. But the, the mechanisms that are in place by state statute that allows the board to adopt an amended budget in December of each year and then a uh, supplemental budget in June of each year. But some of the leading indicators, and I might look to my uh, colleague from Learning Services, are how many students do we see enrolling in um, 
the TCO option. That's, that's one indication. Even though the TCO does count in these numbers as it did last year, but we had a significant number of students that were in that program in 2019-20, in uh, many fewer in 21-22 that are being anticipated right now. Um, we've done open enrollment. Um, so the open enrollment process of students moving not only between schools in the district, but out of the district requesting open enrollment into our schools. Um, that process is finalized or soon to be finalized on the number of students that have open enrolled into the district. Um, there was one more item I was going to say, uh, kindergarten registrations. So we've heard anecdotally of in the in last year of, you've heard the term red shirt. Um, the kids are taking a red shirt year, especially <laughs> kindergartners. Yes. <laughs> meaning they're, they, their parents withheld them from enrolling in kindergarten and then they'll come back this year, which if that took place at a substantial level would really double the size of, a, of our kindergarten grade for this year. Um, we don't see that. Um, the numbers that we saw last year, it wasn't huge, but it was, it was n noticeable of, things, right? of 50 to 100 students probably that were in that category, okay. um, something like that. So those are some of the, the things that we're doing right now from an enrollment standpoint that will help us start firming up that, okay. that number of what these estimates are for next year. Awesome, thank you. And then the second question I had is talking about the funded pupil count. And you, I know, study this stuff and then memorize it in a way that I can't, or haven't, anyway. Um, but I thought this year that the state handled the funded pupil count differently because of COVID. Do we have any expectation that they may do that again for this session? I think what you're referring to, and I'll, I'll try to clarify this, yes. is that the state had what they would call a hold harmless. So if, if the decline because of the significant increase in the budget stabilization factor doubling essentially in 1920, that if the decrease in state funding as a result of the increasing of the budget stabilization factor outpaced the percentage loss in students and most all districts, there were some that actually saw positive increase in their student numbers this year. But if that number of the decrease in your PPR funding was greater than the decrease in the number of students you had, then they would, the, the state um, had a separate pool of money that they tried to equalize at or hold okay. harmless those districts. Okay. Thompson was not in that situation. So okay. our, the rate of decline in our PPR and the rate of decline in our student counts based on the parameters they had in place did not come into play for Thompson. So there was no additional funding that came in 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 2021 that would change the PPR numbers other than what you've seen here already. Okay. I, that, I think that's what you're referring to. Yeah, you said it a lot better than I could. So thank you. Mm. <laughs> you made it made sense. I was like, mm, kind of remember something. Okay, thank you. I knew you. what you were talking about. Yes, thank you. <coughs> Any other questions? No? Good job, Gordon. You had 15 seconds left on your. Oh. You're really, you're really good at, at keeping to time. <laughs> All right, thank you. You're still up for ESSER, though, right? I am. So, item 8.7 is the ESSER 2 update. Thank you again, Madam President. Um, I'll tag team on this uh, presentation with my colleague Don Huckabee from Learning Services and just to show the versatility of the team she will be talking about numbers and I will be talking about text <laughs> hang on um, again alignment with Strive 2025 two primary focus areas for this topic is focus area one of student achievement and as always focus area four stewardship of resources so ESSER II, um, you've heard of all of the various um, federal stimulus dollars that have come into the district. We have CRF, Coronavirus Relief Fund. We have CARES Act, which I will not repeat the acronym for because I can't remember it right now. We have ESSER I, we have ESSER II, we have ESSER III, we have ARPA, we have 
a variety of different things that are out there. So this presentation primarily focuses on ESSER 2 because time is of the essence on, uh, this is the most timely topic right now, ESSER 2. So uh, I'm not going to read the quote at the top, but you can see the language that was in the actual um, federal bill that was adopted by Congress of what these dollars are intended to do. So each state got a, an allocation of these dollars, and then the state, or the Colorado uh, state of Colorado, elected to allocate those dollars out to the districts using the Title I formula that uh, we have in place. So that's the allocation of the funds. If you're wondering how the state decide which districts got what, um, that's the basis of the formula. Um, they're highly recommending, although it's not required, but you expend your ESSER 1 dollars before you start spending ESSER 2, and there's a little different timelines associated with those. The, the next to the last bullet point is a, is a significant one. There's, you can imagine, these are millions of dollars that we're talking about here, and this is, it requires um, increased, um, a lot of increased uh, work from a planning standpoint, from a budgeting standpoint, from tracking the money to reporting on it to um, conducting the audits that uh, they said all of these funds are highly auditable. In fact, we just uh, ha are in the midst of our first audit on the CRF funds. We knew that uh, we would be audited. There, it's, it's not unreasonable to expect that. And really the, the samples that they've chosen and the, the questions that they're asking are, are very reasonable. So, um, but these are highly auditable funds as well. But there is a significant amount of work from a variety of different departments, not just business services, but a variety of departments that um, will be um, impacted by these. They talk about maintenance of effort, although it's not spelled out exactly. Maintenance of effort is what you've heard from grants in the past of supplement, not supplant, meaning you can't take grant dollars and say, great, now we don't have to spend this that we were planning on spending. We can use these grant dollars to take the place of that. While they don't expressly prohibit that, they, um, there's enough language in there that they want you to, the, to make the best use of the dollars. They want the district to do that. The specifics um, for Thompson School District for ESSER 2 is 5.3 million of allocation, 5.3 million dollars. Um, we are required to share those dollars with the charter schools in the district. Um, that's about 11% um, that goes to that. The preliminary budget has to be submitted by September 30th, but uh, we can submit that any time. So we're, we're interested in sooner rather than later. Um, so we can get that submitted to CDE because they have to approve the budget, give us approval to then start spending the dollars. So, uh, so they're, they're saying it's about a two week turnaround time that, that CDE will do. So we're trying to, uh, to meet those, get, get our proposed budget in front of them. We can make adjustments to that preliminary budget. This is not a one and done um, opportunity. We have the ability to go back. If there's something that changes that we say, we don't need to spend the dollars as we initially thought we were going to, and this would be a much better need, still within the confines of what's allowed for in the budget. Um, but we have that ability to make um, another couple adjustments to that budget over the course of the, the time frame. Um, ESSER 2 is a, like ESSER 3 and like ESSER 1 are reimbursement grants where CRF was money that was deposited, sent to us by CDE and said, here you go, you can start spending it. These are reimbursement grants, which means we have to turn in the budget, get approval, spend the dollars, use that out of our available cash right now, which sometimes when you start looking at bigger dollars, 5.3 million, not so much, but when we start looking at 10 or 11 or 12 million for SR3, that could start um, causing some issues from a cash flow perspective. But that's why we have the backstop of the state interest-free loan program that can uh, help, help bridge that gap for us as well. So um, once we spend the dollars, then we turn those receipts in to CDE and get reimbursed for the, the funds. The time period for these expenditures, um, we can look back to March 13th of last year, and we can look forward to September 30th of 2023. We can spend all the money right now if we so choose. 
we can also wait until um, although my uh, grant accountant would very much appreciate if we didn't spend the last dollar on September 30th of 2023 because again there's a lot of reporting that has to go into that and wrapping all that up to to meet all the deadlines but that is the the three and a half year window that is available to the district to be able to utilize these funds so now I will turn it over to Don to talk about some of the uh, proposed expenditures. All right, so as a cabinet team, we looked at, um, identified what needs we saw in the district and what we could use uh, the ESSER funds, especially ESSER 2, as that's kind of the, the first one here. So what you see in the packet are kind of broad categories with some, some details um, underneath them. One of the things we know is we are going to have to continue to provide an opportunity for students for remote learning, um, that fully 100% remote learning. Um, as Gordon said earlier, our numbers are significantly different now than they were um, than the students who are currently in the program. Um, we started in with you know, Thompson Connect Online with about 3,000 kids. And what we have currently registered with registration going through the end of the week, we are at 80, 80 students, K-12. So the numbers that you see here, this was assuming far more students. Um, we were anticipating probably needing at least one elementary teacher per grade level. Um, so we're going to be revising this once we have better numbers. We'll still keep a little bit of a buffer of staff, knowing and anticipating that there may be some families that may not make a decision right now who will be waiting until um, we release what our what our plan is for in-person learning um, in the fall. So that number, you know, th that number will not likely be anywhere near that number. But we just wanted to make sure that we had enough um, allocated there. And it also includes devices. So it's professional developments, devices, it's licenses, and it's the staff. Um, because what we know about this year is students in TCO had differing devices, and that created some challenges for our staff to engage in, oh, you've got an iPad and you have a Chromebook. And so having um, common devices for all the students who are in TCO. So that's, and then those will come back um, to the district to be able to be redeployed um, when we no longer have this remote learning due to COVID. The next big um, one for this is addressing learning loss. And so here, um, really looking at online curriculum that we currently have purchased for our students with disabilities so that they can remain engaged in, um, in material that is appropriate to them. This is where we have summer programming, uh, summer programming for this year as well as next year. So we want to make sure we have two years worth of summer programming, which also includes transportation costs. Um, we also are proposing additional FTE for our schools that are most at risk. So we're looking at, um, in our existing staffing formula, we have an at-risk factor. We're also looking at data. So we're looking at the student data of where did we see, you know, you all looked at data um, with us last week, where did we see schools that had a greater um, drop in the students who moved from you know, at meeting, you know, being at performance level to one level or two years below. So those are some of the things we're looking at um, within that additional FTE and then some additional support to, for professional development because we know there's gonna be a lot of professional development needed to help support our staff in engaging students um, back in school in a, in a more permanent way. The next big category is student and family engagement and support. Um, so this, there's a lot of staffing in here, um, staffing for re-engagement specialists at the high school. So being able to connect with those students who, um, who either have missed a lot of time this year and or who start next year and start to get behind um, or start to not attend. So having some additional staff to be able to, to help, um, help there. Uh, family engagement coordinator. The district has had a family engagement coordinator a number of years ago. Again, in getting families back into uh, into school and to be able to support our schools, so to have a, a family engagement coordinator. 
not all of our elementary schools have full-time counselors. So one of the things that we are proposing here is to increase um, the equivalent FTE to ensure that every elementary school has a full-time counselor for the next two years. And then um, support for expanding um, our before and after school programming. This is really around um, our partnership with the YMCA and Boys and Girls Club and how do we help support um, scholarships for families to be able to continue to access um, those tools. One thing I will say that um, in ESSER 3, we also have a requirement around learning loss. So we've got some additional activities planned for ESSER 3 around learning loss that are uh, more targeted with our own staff for after school or um, whatever, you know, after school, it might be Saturday school to address that. So know that that's coming. Um, it's not in ESSER 2, but it is something that we'll be, um, we'll definitely be putting um, significant resource toward. Under health and safety, um, we have needs for some additional furniture and equipment in our classrooms. Um, we, we don't know exactly what the fall's going to look like, but anticipate we still may need to, to have configurations and, and some furniture to make sure that we can um, have students be uh, distanced apart uh, a bit. Um, new equipment and filters, cleaning supplies, equipment, fans, ventilators, those kinds of things that you know we've put to, to good use some now and we still have some additional needs. And then um, as Todd was talking about in the COVID update, we will still need some um, support with staffing to do contact tracing um, in next year. Under technology, um, and this is separate from the technology that is in there for the remote learning, um, we've purchased a number of, of software that allow us to do distance learning. And because we're anticipating that there still may be potentially um, cohorts or groups of students who may need to be away from school and we need to be able to have them connect. Um, so number of pieces of software within that. Um, with the purchase of all the technology this year to get us to be 100% UTA, um, we need some additional support for devices in helping staff and students with um, you know, the technical devices, the pedagogo pedagogical implementation of just you know, the new, new operation. So um, that's a, a proposal for a, a two year um, to kind of get us over this hump uh, of, for, for a couple of years. And then, um, as Gordon has said it, previously, the charter schools um, are part of our district, so there is an equitable participation allocation. So you see that amount would be what will go to the two charter schools. And then um, we, do we do take an indirect, which helps support the work that he was talking about, our grants managers needing to do, and if we need to bring in any additional staffing to help with audits and those kinds of things, um, that indirect, and then, a um, number of people on our federal programs uh, team, they are, they don't work in that middle of June to middle of July and we anticipate we might need to bring them back for a couple of days. So there's just a, a you know, that's it, not a huge expense in that administration cost, but it is something that we're attending to knowing that, you know, this, again, this summer is not going to be, it'll be more like last summer and still different from previous summers to that. So just want to make sure that we've got um, coverage there. So are there any questions on kind of what our proposed preliminary activities are? Questions, <clears throat> excuse me, questions down this side? Stu. Don, I have a question about the re-engagement specialists mm -hmm. at the high school. Can you tell me a little bit about what those people will do? Absolutely. So these are, um, typically they are classified positions. They are tracking and monitoring student grades, attendance. They make a direct connection with students that we're starting to see a, a little bit of a slip. They then, um, they're, they're kind of like family, student family li liaisons too, in that they work with the student, they bring the student like what are the barriers what are the what are the challenges that that you're experiencing what can we do to get you back on track okay. they also make those connections to the families that sounds like a really important mm -hmm. role as we move roll into next year yep did it i just want to say forever i know we've got we're talking about a small bucket but that just seems like a really important thing for us to to do it may not be in the same numbers as it will be in the next two years but um 
you know, I would love that to be on our radar forever because I almost started crying when I was thinking about it. So it's a good one. And Don, I have a couple of questions. Um, and these might be more appropriate for Gordon, but I'll ask you and you can punt if you need to. Um, I'm wondering, when I looked back to see uh, allowable expenses, it can be anything from March of 2020, which was a year ago now, right? Correct. So are we anticipating <clears throat> covering anything we've already done or incurred? For the most part, we, I believe, and Gordon, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe we were able to cover everything up to this point through our CARES Act, through the CARES Act and our ESSER 1. Okay. Um, there, I mean, there are certainly, you know, we've got some things here that, you know, we're starting to hire, but this really for more next year, and we'll have the summer school, which will be in this fiscal year, right. um, but we'll but be using SR2. backwards, okay. Is that and correct, then the second, Gordon? Okay. okay, then the second question is where, where the funding is being used for FTE, I think I heard you say for two years, but then what happens? Well, and that's the that's the you always the challenge whenever we have grant dollars. Um, not all of this FTE uh, is going to be recommended to be two years. Some of it is, but uh, some of it is not. But we know that if it's a one year or if it's a two year, or even we could do three years because with ESSER three we actually have then yet another year we could use. We just know that those positions, either we have to figure out a way to sustain them in general fund or other federal funds in the future, but this is intended to get us through, you know, through this, this crisis yeah. in a couple of years. And then again, you know, elementary counselors or whatever it That's might be, the one I, yeah. then, then we need to really look yeah. at two years from now, what does, what does that look like and how do we, you know, can we put that into full-time regular regular budget. staffing yeah that's the one i was wondering about mostly because once you once you've got a full-time counselor it's in hard building, to go back you can't take them out i mean <laughs> yeah. you might have to but it, it that's a hard thing to do dr schaefer yes well um, we won't be asking for a formal vote this evening um the reason why we're bringing this forward you can see a lot of these are fte positions we would like to get them posted uh, obviously we're in hiring season we're competing for talent um, while the board will be formally asked to approve this in June, um, we, we kind of, the reason why we brought this forward to you this evening with the level of detail is we're looking for a general, like, are, are we supportive? Do you have questions? Is there anything that we should hold off on? Um, it's obviously a lot of money to expend, but you can see it's mostly tied up in FTE, and we really want to get these positions posted. Board? Any, obje any objections to this plan? <laughs> no, Goodness. No. No. I, no, again, I just want to see, like, this is so important. So. Yeah. Thank I goodness mean, for the ESSER funds. Right? right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Right. Where, would we Where would we be? I mean, I yeah, know it's where not. Would, where would we be? It's not forever funding. We know it's grant funding, but this is one of those times where you do have to thank the federal government for Absolutely. stepping up and helping us out because we would be in dire straits <laughs> without these funds and our students would suffer without these funds so it was so important that they pass this legislation so um, anyway so yes dr yeah. Schaefer, i think that's your answer <laughs> <laughs> one, other, one other quick question don before i let you go and you may not know know the answer to this but i was curious is there a requirement that school districts offer online learning for next year? Because That's a great COVID. question. Um, we just received the guidance that if we do offer it, what do we need to right. do? Um, I'd have to look to see if we are required I'm to. Just, I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, from a, a best practices, these are our sure. students, yeah, and it, yeah. for another, at least another year, to ensure that you know they've got a, a great opportunity yeah. in the face of uncertainty of COVID. Um, I was more thinking if there's other districts that don't do it, oh, we we might get might some we of get them. Those kids, we might. Yes. That's that is that is possible. Where I, was thinking, but. I like that thinking. Okay. All right. Anything else? Thanks, Don. Thank you. And Gordon. And Gordon, yes, thanks, Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least tonight, item 8.8, .8, a negotiations update with Dr. Bill Siebers and Andy Crisman.
from TEA. Madam President, School Board, Dr. Schaefer, Bill Sievers, Chief Human Resources Officer of this amazing district. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for Andy Chrisman and myself to present on uh, negotiations. The notes were sent to you previously, so you had an opportunity to review it. Uh, we won't go through every single thing, but I'll be talking about day one, and then uh, Mr. Chrisman will be talking about day two. So day one, uh, we had a continuation of story question number three, and that's how do we provide a continuum of services that ensure a safe learning and teaching environment to meet the needs of a diverse student population. We had Dr. Jennifer Guthels, Director of Student Success. She added to the story, and she had talked about a layered support, which is universal for all students. Targeted is tier two, and in intensive is tier three. Prior years, there were the 20 SEL positions that were reduced to six, but CARES Act, we were able to increase it to 12 positions, so that's an uh, item that we're uh, talking in negotiations right now. And uh, talked about Atlas program for middle school for targeted intensive support, and then universal support for students will be required staff to be trained. And then we were honored with uh, our chief financial officer, Mr. Gordon Jones, to come in for the presentation. And he took up about an hour of, of our time to, to discuss the items that are on here. But we were honored to have him and, and all, the, all the great knowledge he brings to the negotiations table. So we appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So he talked about the long bill. And uh, as he was talking about that, half of the the uh, negotiation team was a little confused with that conversation. Uh, and then we got into October student count, and, and that's humor, I, I'm just using humor, like we were having intense conversations about that. October student count, so there are bullets there, and I won't get into the numbers, uh, you can kind of read that, I, I definitely don't want to mix up the numbers. And then expenditure increases, and then federal st stimulus funds. And I know I tease Gordon, but uh, to have Gordon in our district is it, truly amazing. Like his knowledge and his presentations, and, and just the way he can take information and, and uh, just explain it in the way that people understand and are able to ask questions, I think that's extremely Im important to understand the numbers. So, you know, I, uh, I give Gordon a hard time all the time, but I truly appreciate him coming in uh, and his wealth of knowledge. And then discussion, we talked about question number one, how can we provide opportunities for effective professional development within the district? And, and that took the majority of the day uh, discussing uh, what PD looked like. So we talked about interest, the options, criteria, and, and then we have a minor straw design. We definitely agree that we need more consistent PD spread out throughout the year. Uh, we're looking at instructional time, minutes per day and per year uh, to see if there's any room and flexibility with that. We talked about restoring the two furlough days because currently we're right now with the furlough days, all, all contracts are reduced by two days. So 260s are 258 and then teacher contracts are 185, which are 183. So, uh, so the need to restore the furlough days. And then we're looking at the 12 non-contact days that could be available for PD. Professional Development, TENS Week, uh, which is Thompson Education Network System, and then Ed Camp and Personalized Days and Parent-Teacher Conferences. And then there was a small discussion about combo late start and district time monthly and quarterly. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Andy Chrisman to talk about April 9th, uh, session number five. Dr. Schaefer. Madam President, members of the board, I'm Andy Christman, president of the Thompson Education Association. Um, on April 9th, we continued um, our discussions. We went over our straw designs on question three and question five and identified some next steps uh, for the, the things we wanted to look at some in more depth. And, and, and with question number three, it involved uh, doing some more in-depth costing out what some of the items would, would, would end up, so that if we put together it into a package, what it might end up uh, costing. Uh, we also looked at um, uh, some questions and some reach outs we needed to do around some of the specific options in the straw design. Um, so hopefully we'll have that data by April 29th. Um, we also reviewed straw design and had some uh, further conversations around the PD question number one. Uh, there is a typo on page four. Um, the No, actually there isn't. Restore furlough days and gain two additional contract days was another thing we talked about. So it's not 183 to 8185, it's now 185 to 187 as an option. Um, we then went through story interest options criteria on question five, which is how do we structure time within the contract day? Um, 
and uh, to maximize student learning and teacher effectiveness. And we talked um, about kind of what the current COVID reality is and what the current overall reality is around the, the day. Um, and we talked about some of the interests and options around that. And then we talked about um, our recruit and retain question number six uh, and talked about uh, some of the history and the things around that um, and some of the interests and options of, uh, that we could, could look at um, around uh, supporting everyone and then supporting some people in some specialized positions. Um, Two plus two then met on uh, Wednesday the 14th and then again yesterday to kind of go over some things and, and planned an agenda for Thursday and Friday of next week. I believe that's it. And we're both available to answer questions. So before that, uh, the thing that we did was uh, we extended negotiations by two days. So we have whole days for May 5th and uh, May 10th. So if we need to extend uh, negotiations, we have those days and we're planning to uh, do that in person. And, and the other thing, uh, the big picture uh, negotiations, the thing that we talk about is loss of learning with students. So that's really a focus through negotiations, uh, you know, and also the SEL positions and the support that students are going to need coming back. So that, that really has been our focus of conversations. So at this time, we'll, uh, Andy Christman will take the questions. <laughs> questions board? <laughs> no? Just one quick one. Uh, the 29th and 30th, did you say that's in person or online? That, uh, that's virtual. virtual? Online. Are they all going to be virtual, you think? Uh, the, the next two will be, but the ones we have on hold for May 5th and 10th will be in person. There is a, a conflict with our facilitator. Susan Sparks, oh, so she that she wasn't able to do in, in person for the next two days. Okay. But she's still facilitating? She is. Okay, yeah. just virtually. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you to your teams for the work as well. Okay. All right. That takes us to the end of our agenda. There's a written report attached, item 9.1, Families Partnering in Education, which is the early childhood uh, policy Council report. Um, reminder that tomorrow we have a visit out at Riverview K-8 at 4 o'clock. Bring your vests and your hard hats, wear your boots. What else? And then we have our meeting after that. Our uh, study session from 5 to 8 will be in the boardroom. What else upcoming? That's a lot <laughs> in the next 20 It's just hours. one day, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, if there's nothing, is that there are any uh, requests or uh, any other information at this time? No? All right. Hearing nothing, I'll call us adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.